Welcome back to the Sportsman Zone. Just three days after recording a sensational victory, the West Indies suffered a six-wicket loss to England in the second one-day international played on Wednesday to leave the three-match series tied at one apiece. In the day-night encounter played at the Sir Vivian Richards Stadium in North Sound, Antigua and Barbuda, the Windys centre-back were dismissed for 202. Skipper Shea Hope again fired with a knock of 68. He was supported by Shervin Rutherford, who contributed 63, a maiden ODI half-century for the 25-year-old that coming in a 129-run Fifth wicket stand. England in reply got to 206 for four. Opener Will Jack top scored with 73. Guyanese Gurakesh Moti bagged two for 34, while there was a wicket apiece for Rutherford and Romaria Shepherd. Both teams will now turn their attention to Saturday's series decider at the Kensington Oval in Barbados. We are joined by cricket analyst Fazir Mohammed. And Fazir Mohammed, you spoke about consistency when we had that conversation. On Tuesday, nothing consistent about the West Indies top to middle order, 23 for 4. And from there, the writing was pretty much on the wall after Sam Curran had ripped through the main batsmen. Indeed it was, and you could almost say, well, England were the same, because remember Sam Curran uh, conceded nearly 100 runs, uh, the most by an England bowler in an ODI, and that was on Sunday. And then he was the man of the match yesterday. But, you, you know, it, it, I think it was the, the late great Tony Cozier. Uh, who coined the phrase about the West Indies in that latter period uh, when he was alive, sadly passed away in 2016, that the West Indies have been consistently inconsistent. And if you look at the West Indies' performances from the start of that qualifying campaign for the World Cup, when the West Indies failed uh, to make it through at that point, they, they won two matches in a row, then lost, then tied, a match they eventually lost in the Super Over. They lost, one lost, lost, one lost, one lost. So that tells you that basically the performances we've seen so far have been true to form. Spectacular one day, ordinary the next, and now we're left guessing as to what's going to happen on Saturday. Yeah, when you look at the, the second one day international and specifically the batting now, do you feel it was a matter of approach or did England just bowl significantly better? So take, for example, someone like Alec Athenes, who came out blazing in the first one day international, seemed quite timid in the second ODI. Well, credit to England. We, we need to also recognize that they bowled a lot better. And yes, there might be a, a level of, of, of timidity in, in that sense uh, from Athens, uh, but you have to give England credit because Curran bowled superbly, bowled a proper line across the right-handers, got the wickets and so on. The West Indies, though, uh, again, the fact of the matter is that you look at the numbers, the, 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 especially the experienced players, even the not-so-experienced players, they have performances that tell you that consistency remains the challenge. And therefore, with the exception, of course, notably of the captain, Shea Hope, with that half-century to follow up the match-winning 100, that until and unless these players, batting, bowling, and fielding, improve their game to the level where it becomes almost a given that they're going to make a decent contribution, you're never going to have 100% success. That's impossible. Until and unless these players reach that level as far as their, their temperament, their technique, their levels of awareness at the highest levels of the game, we're going to have these situations. What to me was particularly galling about yesterday's performance after that century stand was how quickly the West Indies folded and the manner in which they folded because it's one of the cardinal sins to not use up your full allotment of overs whether it be T10, whether it be T20, whether it be 50 over a side. And to be dismissed in the 40th over, leaving 10 overs unused. And again, to add to that, the manner in which those wickets went down, I think, again, it reflected that, that, that failure to appreciate the circumstances in which they were in. 
Yeah, speaking of the matter of not using the full allotment of overs fans, we've seen this so consistently with the West Indies team. Is it an inability to assess the format and how to approach batting 50 overs as opposed to 20, 25, 30, 35 and 40? Indeed, and, and, and this is something that, again, in the same way that I referenced a feeling and, and, and fitness and sharpness in the field as being non-negotiable, surely you, you, you're playing at an elite level. I'm tired of hearing, well, you know, they're young, you know, they're inexperienced. We've been saying that for nearly 30 years through different, different periods. The fact of the matter is if you're playing at international level, you should be able to appreciate your circumstances that you're in because you would have experienced it at the lower levels and then you would have been able to come through it and therefore at the higher level of the game, surely you appreciate when you're going into bat, if the West Indies would have lost two or three early wickets that you need to consolidate. Having done so, and maybe another wicket or two goes down, the lower order recognizes that, look, there are a lot of overs available. Okay, maybe we not, may not get a whole heap of boundaries, but surely there is the recognition that by playing sensibly, you should be able to pick up three, four, five runs and over with a bit of luck, the odd boundary. That is about awareness. It, it, I don't think it re requires any particular levels of genius to appreciate that situation. Yeah, and Faz, you speak about the experienced players stepping up. And for me, one such player will be Shimron Hetmeyer. He has showed us what he's capable of, but I feel like we didn't get that from him for this series so far. Yesterday, of course, dismissed 4-0. And it's about time that Shimron Hetmeyer shows that level of, of desire and commitment representing the West Indies. We all know about the issues from last year with the World T20, where he was supposed to board the plane. He didn't. We all know about the issues previously over the previous couple of years where he didn't meet fitness requirements, although he was starring uh, for, for Rajasthan in the Indian Premier League and seemed to be enjoying that environment. But if he wants to play for the West Indies, you have to perform. This is a, a time yet again where we find ourselves in a situation where the West Indies have to rebuild. And it's not good enough to simply say, well, things didn't work out today or better tomorrow. Let's put that in the past. The fact of the matter is, given his experience, a, a, a leader of a West Indies under-19 team that won the World Cup against India of all teams in 2016, making a senior international debut just a few months later against Pakistan. So seven years hence, there, there should be no talk about feeling his way and getting back, back attuned to what is required. This is the highest level of the game. This is international cricket. And whether it be Shimron Hepmeyer, whether it be Alzari Joseph, also a member of that team, Casey Carty, who continues to struggle to really get the ball of the square and score at a runner ball. It's unacceptable that we should be having these discussions about, about players who have been around and about for such a long period of time. Yeah. For sure. He really needs to step up and we're hoping that we can see that from him in this third ODI. Faz, what about the innings from Shivin Rutherford? How he was able to really, you know, get us to some respectable total alongside the captain, Shea Hope. What did you make of that innings? Well, given the way that he generally bats in the T20 format, you're almost waiting for him to give it away. And I thought he curbed that instinct very well. Yes, he had that spectacular start first ball. He hit for six in the first match on Sunday, but then was out, not thinking, hitting into the wind, caught on the boundary just two balls later, which didn't help his side. Thankfully, the West Indies were able to win with Shea Hope and Romario Shepherd with that excellent partnership. And again, credit to Rutherford for recognizing his role in a situation of 23 for four. That is not the time for big shots. And he was aware of the situation. Yes, eventually he fell for 63. You would have liked to see him go on. And that's an another thing. When you are in a situation at 129 odd, 153 odd for four, another wicket goes down, another two, and England are back in control, as we saw. So that's why it's a very difficult situation. But credit to him for having recognized the situation, played his part in a century stand. And you, again, you really want to see him you want to see Athenes, you want to see Brandon King, you want to see Carty, Hetmeyer, all the names with the exception, of course, of Shea Hope, as I mentioned already. 
You want to see them recognize what playing at the highest level is all about and what representing the West Indies is all about. Yet, yeah, fans, on Sunday, we saw the West Indies captain, Shea Hope, become the 11th uh, player from the Caribbean to reach 5,000 runs in one day international cricket. Is opposite number, Joss Butler, becoming the fifth Englishman to 5,000 runs in one day international cricket yesterday. Um, of note, though, Butler's 5,000 run mark coming up in his 153rd game, worth 114 games for Shea Hope. But a quick word on the England captain who has really struggled in recent recent times, but coming good yesterday. Indeed. And he's had a really terrible time. And the, the fact is that he has been the captain of a poor England team in defence of the World Cup. Yet he's maintained, and indeed he said it yesterday after the match speaking uh, to, to Samuel Badri, that he believes he's a better player than that. And his numbers show that. And he was able to deliver with that 58 not out yesterday. So credit to him. It might be a bit of a surprise that only five England batters have gotten beyond 5,000 runs in one day international cricket. But that often reflects the nature of English cricket, where they're chopping and changing and making so many uh, different, op exciting so many different options along the way. But for England, now with their captain getting some runs and maybe some greater confidence with it, they'll be going into Barbados, which is popularly known as Little England, for that match on Saturday afternoon, thinking that it's almost a home fixture for them. So they'll feel very comfortable in that environment in Kensington Oval. And therefore, it's up to the West Indies to rise to that challenge. Yeah, I'm curious, fans, because in the aftermath of a terrible World Cup for England, they have kept faith with 33-year-old Joss Butler as captain in a phase that they consider to be a rebuilding phase for the next World Cup. But come the next World Cup, Mr. Butler will be 37-year-old. Mind you, just one year younger than Darren Bravo will be at that time. But he's the man who is leading the charge with the youngsters at this stage, at the beginning of the rebuilding process. Your thoughts? And that would have to be a discussion that would have taken place with those at the helm of English cricket, Rob Key, the, the, the man in charge, as to whether or not they see Joss Butler, whether he gets to the World Cup or not, as the man to continue to lead England. Remember, there's the World T20 coming up, where England are also the, the, the defending champions. Will it be a disastrous defence? We'll have to wait and see in six months' time in the Caribbean and the USA. But unlike the Bravo situation, and I am totally in disagreement with your point of view on Rob Wife, and I'm, I'm happy to, to, to start admit and, and agree that I think his time has passed as far as being ready for a next World Cup, but that's another discussion. The fact of the matter is England have decided that Joss Butler, for better or for worse, is the man to rebuild the England team from the ashes of the World Cup, and only time will tell if they're correct. Yeah, I'm glad you went there, Faz, because my own thoughts on the on the Bravo situation, it's not necessarily about getting to the next World Cup. I believe that he still has a lot to offer, and even if that ends up being two or three years, if he is good enough now to help the team to win and to create a winning momentum, then I think you still select him, because I don't believe, um, like... Desmond Haynes said in February that we are at a stage where we have the luxury of not selecting our best players because we feel, oh, you're a little bit too old or you won't be around in three or four years' time. I hear you on that. And indeed, you could go through the list of statements from, from Desmond Haynes to find a litany of contradictions. So I get you on, on that one. The selection of Keon Otley, just one year younger than Bravo, again, confounds that. And, and, and by the way, Shane Dorich, at 32 years old, out of the wilderness. Exactly. So I, I, again, contradictions are plenty. But in West Indies cricket, we seem to have a major problem with planning and planning properly. Hence the inconsistency even there in the selection process. If, to go with your point, Bravo does well against England, against whoever next year, but, but then runs, runs into a, a, a poor patch, Basically, what you now have to do is to get a, another player into that spot, get them attuned, get them ready, and indeed get them in, in a position where they can make a contribution to qualify for a World Cup. So I'm not dismissing your point about his success in the regional Super 50 and what he can contribute right now. My point is that West Indies cricket have failed abysmally 
over successive World Cup cycles, successive tournaments to plan properly. We had the Chris Gale foolishness of 2019, where after that abysmal World Cup showing, he was still in the West Indies one-day team with obviously no, no, no recognition that there was no way he would have a chance of playing in 2023. So again, as a selector, you have to make tough decisions, but it's about communication. And Bravo alluded to the fact that no one told him anything. Surely it was up to the chairman of selectors not to pass the word on to somebody else, go and talk to Bravo or something. It's your duty. He owes uh, Robin Powell a phone call as well. Unacceptable. The fact of the matter is you need to communicate with players why they are being left out. What is the rationale? The player may disagree, and I'm sure they disagree, but at least you've done the right thing by communicating with the individual. Yeah, there are many points of what you just said that I completely agree with, Faz, but there is one particular point that I don't agree with, and I think we all know what that particular point is, so we can leave it there for today. As usual, Faz, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, and we'll chat again, and hopefully the West Indies can find their good side and clinch the series in Barbados on Saturday. Take care. Thank you. All right, let's go to a break. We'll be back with more on the Sportsmax Zone.